So maybe we could just start off by talking a little bit about um, when you came to Grand Valley uh, and in what capacity and what brought you to, 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 to work there. I came to Grand Valley in 1973. That's when I moved to Michigan. And uh, I was one of the founding faculty members of what we called College Four, which was uh, a, a, a self-paced mastery learning uh, college in the Grand Valley Federation. It was finally named Kirkhoff College uh, for Mr. Russell, Mr. Russell Kirkhoff, who, who gave uh, a large donation to Grand Valley. And what was your, uh, your particular interest to come work for Grand Valley, I and mean, why, why at the particular that college? Well, it has a lot to do with Bob Toff. Okay. <laughs> uh, he had been uh, the, um, the NSF contact person, I can't remember the technical name for it, for a project that I was um, coordinating at Oklahoma State University when he was at NSF and we got to know each other that way. He put together a big dream for a college pulling together some of the uh, many educational uh, approaches that he was seeing at NSF and made a, a pitch to Grand Valley uh, to, to launch that college. And I was the first or second person that he hired because I was doing a lot of what he was going to do at Grand Valley at Oklahoma State. But he had put together more a more comprehensive uh, uh, college situation where students weren't bound by, by time or pace or those kinds of things. They could come to college on rainy days and do road construction when, they <laughs> when that was available. This is the same time that William James and Thomas Jefferson... Those were, were. Those were in full tilt. Okay. College Four was the last new uh, college in the Federation. Because these different aspects of different colleges, uh, I don't know, what was that, at the time, Grand Valley State College, uh, was, were very forward thinking, very progressive, uh, very open minded, sort of very alternative in terms of an educational model. I mean, how much, in your experience, did that have an influence in Grand Valley being Maybe again a little bit ahead of the curve in terms of West Michigan universities or schools about grappling with the issues around LGBT uh, issues. Well, I would have to separate those those two. Okay. <laughs> Grand Valley was way ahead of the curve in terms of innovative education. It uh, had one of the best uh, AV uh, setups of, of any college in the country. Every classroom. Uh, in the in the college was was wired into a to a central audio visual from from which they could could uh, pipe uh, relay movies uh, films videos whatever uh, and Grand Valley has has kind of stayed a, a ahead of the curve in in technology I would say we caught up with the curve <laughs> in terms of LGBT because for uh, political and financial reasons. Uh, I think Grand Valley, I, I can honestly say, almost had to be uh, careful, cautious, conservative uh, with regard to LGBT. And could you say a little more about why, why that's the case? Why do you think it had to be cautious or conservative about those kinds of issues? I mean, what, what kind of climate would sort of you know, sort of determine that that was the direction you think it should take. Well, politi politically and religiously conservative uh, is are the are the words that still describe uh, West Michigan. Uh, from my perspective, it is it's opening up some, uh, becoming uh, uh, progressive is too much, <laughs> but uh, it's moving it's moving in that direction, uh, and it's. It's moving to a point where it can include uh, the LGBT community, community and be less afraid of us um, uh, in, in terms of maybe people boycotting the university if, if, if they include us explicitly. Uh, there was a long period of time where 
the words gay and lesbian, bisexual, transgender did not appear anywhere uh, on Grand Valley's campus or, or in the literature. I think the very first time that LGBT occurred in, uh, uh, in any Grand Valley literature was with the LGBT scholarship that uh, my partner Gary Van Harn and others put together. That was a, that was a real coup. And part of the way that we made friends with, with Grand Valley was to um, become involved in fundraising and uh, that part of the university. What year did that take place? And you're mentioning one, uh, <laughs> Gary, sort of that, that sort of like. That must have been about 04, 05. You know, and again, as a as a faculty person, when when was the kind of the earliest efforts to sort of kind of have conversations with other faculty um, to start sort of working towards creating some kind of a structure or a mechanism that would allow faculty and staff and then eventually students to to be uh, open about their identities? Well, that's a that's a fairly a longer history than uh, than people might realize. When I came to Grand Valley in 1973, I saw a sign posted for a meeting of the Gay Alliance. And uh, later through, uh, through Jim Toy at, uh, at uh, the University of Michigan, I found, I, he, he sent me uh, a Lanthorn announcement, I think that dated back to 1972, uh, come see a Kind of ha come have a conversation with a real live homosexual <laughs> at uh, at this uh, assigned meeting place at Grand Valley. So there there was something. There was it was way underground, but mm. but uh, but there was already uh, people uh, reaching toward each other and and toward community and trying to have a life and identity uh, at uh, campus. About 20 years ago, uh, Gloria Tate established the uh, Allies and Advocates. And uh, Allies and Advocates is an organization of faculty and staff to train faculty and staff to be aware of student needs and to be comfortable with students if they would come to them with uh, an LGBT question. And that's still uh, an ongoing, very active organization. And about the same time, the student organization Out and About uh, was formed. And for a long time, Out and About uh, was, was the major voice at, at Grand Valley for LGBT, uh, supported um, in very real terms, but, but not in an ongoing um, institutionalized way by uh, allies and advocates. Uh, out and about was the you know the every week every every occasion presence of uh, LGBT at, at Grand Valley. Uh, when I came on the scene, I was asked very much to my pleasure to be a faculty advisor to Out and About, and my my first um, real acquaintance with uh, LGBT at Grand Valley was through that organization. And for about eight years, I attended all their uh, nine o'clock Wednesday night meetings. <laughs> Got to be good friends with a lot of neat people through that. What do you think it meant to the students who were part of the Out and group to have you know, faculty such as yourself be in that advisory capacity? And then also, what did it mean to you to kind of you know, be a part of those kinds of conversations? Well. I, I think it meant everything in both directions. Uh, I think the students were helped by the fact that I, uh, if I, if student organizations are totally student run. And I didn't have to learn that the hard way. I just, I, I, I figured that out. So at many of those meetings, I said nothing. Uh, but I, soon caught on to the fact that it was just very important for me to be there. 
uh, showing uh, support faculty and in that, in, the, in that way institutional support for them. But those were the days in which they, for safety reasons, they wouldn't announce the, the place uh, that the meeting, it seems really strange with the center now, mm -hmm. that, that there was a time in easy memory when uh, it wasn't safe to announce the, a meeting place for <laughs> the LGBT uh, student support group. But in many ways, it was, it was through, through that group that many, many other streams flow into the center, but uh, the out and about students had to dream for a center for a long, long time. And that eventually came to fruition in what year? Oh, it's hard to it's hard to tell. <laughs> I, I 05, I think is a is a year that that I, I might put on it. Uh, that was when I moved to uh, the College of uh, Interdisciplinary Studies, now Brooks College of Interdisciplinary Studies, uh, and joined that faculty full time. I had been uh, before that in the English department for for many years. Um, but I, I moved to uh, uh, Brooks College, I'll just call it that because that's what it is now, because I felt like I would have uh, easier access to, to students and they would have easier access to me, partly just because of the physical way the office was set up. And uh, we were able by that time to put uh, LGBT resources uh, on my door. LG, uh, Lib Studies faculty and LGBT resources, but we still couldn't call it a center or an office mm -hmm. or anything that, that was that permanent. So for two, two years, three years. So when I moved into my new office in what is now Brooks College, I had on my door not only Milt Ford Lib Studies, but LGBT, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender resources, and so not, what now we not only had a now we not only had a scholarship that was listed in the catalog, but we had a door <laughs> with uh, LGBT on it. And soon soon after that, there were pl plans developed for uh, the new wing on uh, Kirchhoff Center, which was to to house some of the student services. And we started planning uh, to transfer the uh, LGBT resources from my office to, to that building. And it worked out uh, through the efforts of a lot of people, uh, including Bart Merkel, the Dean of Students, that uh, we moved in to, in uh, the fall of 08, we moved into the space that had previously been the Women's Center and now we have a 1,500 foot full-time LGBT resource center right in the, uh, in the, just off of the main traffic flow of the campus center, which to me is perfect. It's, it's a little bit around the corner for, for people for whom that's important, but it's right there at the flow uh, for the convenience of students to drop in. There's also been some evolution and progress made in terms of what's offered at, at the academic level, right? And, and my understanding of the, even kind of moving towards sort of a, a you know, queer theory being taught and that there even being a minor being potentially being offered. I mean, can you say something about that sort of progression in terms of, from an academic point of view, what kind of classes have been offered to, to students? From the academic perspective, the, the very current pre present is a proposal of uh, an LGBTQ minor, uh, which would be in the Women and Gender Studies Department or program. Uh, we've been teaching courses uh, really all over the university in terms of criminal justice and uh, health and various things, uh, as well as in Women and Gender Studies and Lib Studies, uh, an, in an intro to lesbian and gay studies, which I've been teaching for about 10 years, and even longer, a course which is still has the strange name of uh, understanding the gay life cycle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're looking for 
a new name for that, like understanding LGBT life or something like mm -hmm. that, because there re really isn't a LGBT life cycle mm -hmm. like worms and butter bean, lima beans. Right. <laughs> right. So I always get to laugh about that the right. first first night of class. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, those all those courses will will be folded in uh, with the addition of one new course uh, called Queer Theory. And Queer Theory is an important development uh, academically because it's where uh, women's studies and postmodern studies have focused on LGBT queer is issues. And uh, it's a very well established discipline now. And when students take uh, the intro to LGBT studies, they, w they will get a good um, background of history and what it was like to be individuals at different points in, uh, in history. They'll, they'll look at, at the medical issues, they'll look at AIDS, they'll look at the various uh, <laughs> stages toward uh, <coughs> equality, which is still <laughs> a work in, in progress. And then in the uh, queer theory course, they will take a look at um, the way theorists look at uh, uh, sex, gender, and identity experience. And that will be uh, another kind of orientation to uh, and a deepening of understanding of LGBT lives. We're very excited about that. Yeah, that's great. Uh, there's been efforts for years to try to get uh, for um, for faculty and staff to get domestic partner benefits as part of the uh, labor benefits uh, for for employees of, of the university. Uh, were you involved at all in, the, in, in any of those campaigns you know, to, to, to achieve that, that, that goal? I w was involved in what I see as the first round or the, the, the last part of the first round. Uh, uh, President Lubbers had had an advisory group for, for many years uh, that worked effort with, with great effort toward, uh, toward domestic partner benefits. And the thing I haven't said yet is that I just came out, uh, I got divorced and came out about 15 years ago. And that almost immediately became a very hot and interesting item at, at Grand Valley. So I not only became faculty advisor to Out and About, but I came one, became one of the major spokespersons for the LGBT, uh, for the domestic partner benefits. And I came out to many people on television, radio, and newspapers. It was, <laughs> when, I, when I came out, I, I came out, some people talk about flaming out of the closet, and that's what I did. I had, I had done a lot of work internally, and, and when I came out, I was ready to be a part of the community and to do what I could to, to move us forward. <laughs> As best my understanding, there was certainly some resistance to that earlier campaign in the mid-90s or so to, to get domestic partner benefits. Yes, there was resistance to, to, the, to the extent that it was uh, it did not come to fruition then. It was taken off the table for about 10 years. Was that resistance kind of internal, just folks within the campus community that was sort of resisting, or were there external forces that sort of... My read of the situation is, is, is that the campus has basically always supported uh, domestic partner benefits. And it's the, um, some of the in, environmental, <laughs> uh, folks that that have had serious problems with it, and and uh, it is it is a cultural change, and and you can't pretend like there's there's no sense or background in in in, in people's uh, resistance or, or hesitance, but it was it was very it was very real, and the community I would I would put it this way the community was just not ready to go along with, with Grand Valley at that, at that time. Mm -hmm. 
and I see it as a huge step forward, both for the community and for and for Grand Valley, that two two years ago, two and a half, I guess it was two, maybe two years ago this summer, maybe it was three years ago, uh, the Board of Trustees voted uh, to grant domestic partner benefits. And that was a huge milestone because even when attitudes uh, were, were changing and uh, there was a, a center either there or on the way, it was ha the, that inequity was hanging over the LGBT community like a, like a dark cloud. And it was a huge celebration, and, and, and rightly so, and, and uh, largely or partly or somewhere between largely and partly uh, to the, uh, the credit of a new faculty staff organization called the fac Faculty and, oh my God. <laughs> We're gonna have to do some editing here. <laughs> It was uh, obtaining the domestic partner benefits was largely due to the efforts of the faculty and staff association, which was a which was a relatively new organization uh, developed to achieve those benefits and to work in an ongoing way on making Grand Valley a good place uh, to be a faculty and staff member. You were mentioning when you were talking about the some of the classes that you that you, you particularly teach about in helping students understand sort of the history of the LGBT community in the, within the U.S. or in the world, for that matter. For that matter. Uh, how important is it for them to understand it in terms of just West Michigan or even just at Grand Valley itself, considering the significant changes that have happened over the last couple of decades? I mean, just from the point where there was no resource center, there was no courses before offered, that it was difficult for anybody to be out uh, as a, as a, as a, as an anything, uh, as an anything, as a, you know, as a faculty member or student or anything. Uh, I mean, how important do you think it is for students to kind of get that sense that this is a fairly recent shift, even though it's not where we want to be completely, but. I think that's very important because the present very quickly becomes history and, and people are, assume that things are have always been the way they are and that's one of the major reasons for for the course but I, I really don't put it explicitly in the West Michigan Grand Valley context I, I put it in the uh, almost in an international and, and uh, in national context of uh, of the movement of uh, various attempts to define LGBT identity, mm -hmm. and to go through the disappointment of having that criminal, criminal, criminalized and pathologized. And uh, we talk a lot about uh, the homophile movement, which preceded Stonewall. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the gay liberation didn't, wasn't born uh, full grown at, uh, at Stonewall. There was a lot of work before then. But it was, in retrospect, it was very modest and, and, and very small. So Stonewall was the, the gay shot heard around the world right. kind of right. thing. And uh, it's, very, it's very important to put all that in, in context. And inevitably, I talk about what is going on, Hannah has gone on at, at Grand Valley. Uh, I find it a little bit hard, just because I am who I am, uh, to talk very much about my role in that. And uh, recently I've published uh, two books. Uh, one, a, a theoretical research book on um, gay men in heterosexual marriage. Uh, that was uh, uh, 09, and then in 10 I published a novel that I've been working on for 20 years, uh, which is a very fictionalized uh, version of my coming out story. And I, I go through whole classes without, without mentioning uh, either of those books. And then when I, when I do, students say, you should talk more about, <laughs> mm -hmm. you should talk more about what you've done. And uh, uh, that makes you more of a resource for us. So since they put it that way, I've, I've been talking more about my, about my role in, in these things in, in West Michigan and Grand Valley. But the courses are in, basically in the, in the context of uh, a, the larger 
movements and scholarship. Since you mentioned Stonewall, some other historical sort of, you know, watershed moments, so I'm just wondering in terms of that, you know, Stonewall or the HIV AIDS crisis of the 80s or other national campaigns around, you know, marriage equality or other, other issues, have you, have you seen, uh, have those kinds of national struggles in any way been manifested on, at the local level? Do you think they've influenced people's ability to feel like maybe there's more space for them to kind of take on the same kind of issues even in West Michigan because there are clearly organizations around the country who are who are grappling with the same kind of stuff? I think it, it gives the, the national movements and, uh, and gains give West Michigan people more permission to be themselves, uh, to maybe claim a, a gay or lesbian, bisexual, transgender identity a little more quickly than, than they would have uh, before. Uh, I know that that, that, that manifests, well, it, it manifests itself in all areas of the community, but very dramatically in the transgender community. Uh, when I started working with uh, Out and About as a faculty advisor, there, there was not one single transgender student identifying it. We know that they were, statistically, demographically, they have to have been at Grand Valley. Mm -hmm. But no one was uh, feeling comfortable enough to, to identify. Now we have, an we have a student organization explicitly uh, for uh, trans, Transgender students created their, their organization mm -hmm. to, to support themselves. Mm -hmm. And the last class that I had had uh, four transgender, mm -hmm. identifying transgender people in it. So the, uh, I think that that's, a, that that's a reflection both of national growth and certainly of Grand Valley growth. I, I, people are identifying uh, and participating uh, because we've created a visibly friendly, supportive environment at Grand Valley. Could you talk a little bit about maybe the relationship to um, you know, Grand Valley as an institution and the sort of the gains that have been made there and, and, as, and then with, with Grand Rapids itself? So I'm just wondering how much interaction there has been or influence that, you know, people on students or faculty or staff on campus have had on, you know, the organizations like the network or the, you know, the pride celebrations or any other dynamics that have happened in West Michigan, uh, you know, the men's choir, those kinds of things. Uh, how much sort of overlap or, you know, intersectionality takes place there in terms of, of people, um, uh, you know, seeing what Grand Valley's doing and what, yeah. what's happening in Grand Rapids. I, I wish I could say more about the uh, Grand Rapids part. I'm, I'm a member of the network and, and, su and support it, and uh, I'm really glad that it's there and, it, and it's, it's doing good work. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm just more comfortable with uh, my knowledge and experience at Grand Valley. And the way I think I can answer this question of um, the Grand, the Grand Rapids, Grand Valley relationship is that for a long time it was frustrating to the LGBT community at Grand Valley to feel that we were totally uh, following the lead of the community. And we had the sense that in, in this area, as, as in many areas, the you know, the, state, the state university in the area should be taking the lead. And I think in the last five years that, uh, that balance has tipped. And I see that Grand Valley is, is now taking the lead in, uh, in West Michigan for an, under, an understanding and acceptance and integration of LGBT life into the community. Well, you know, maybe by at least the last question I have, um, you know, in terms of since you again have been at Grand Valley for a while, you've worked a lot with students, both as an advisory role uh, as, a, as a professor, 
getting the LGBT Resource Center off the ground. I mean, what what kind of uh, Advice. I mean, what kind of sort of hopes do you have for future students who come uh, in terms of, you know, what the best case scenario would be in terms of students feeling free to be who they want to be and being supported by that and not have to deal with maybe the, some of the stuff that historically people have had to deal with. I mean, what, uh, what kind of words would you have for students about, you know, their future uh, coming to Grand Valley uh, who, who self-identify as part of the LGBTQ community? I think I would say that Grand Valley takes uh, its mission <laughs> to support diversity uh, uh, maximally seriously. And I'm going to start that again. <laughs> I, would, I would say to an LGBT student looking at Grand Valley that Grand Valley would give them uh, maximum support in in terms of uh, a feeling of safety on campus, organizations to participate in, uh, accommodations with uh, with uh, living assignments that would work for them where they are, if, if specifically in uh, and transgender experience. Grand Valley is fully fully tuned to the to the safety and uh, effectiveness of student, uh, effectiveness of a student, being a student, and in, in the wide variety of the social uh, and academic setting. I was, I was thinking uh, yesterday about uh, this uh, interview, and I, I, I made up the question, <laughs> what what is what is what is the most important thing to you that that your life is now focused on? And since I don't, since it's not everything that I am, I'm going to say one of the top two, <laughs> and maybe the top of, of of those two would be to work toward a world, starting with the one that we live in, where people can grow up knowing who they are, and not only knowing who they are, but to claim who they are, and not to have to have all kinds of false starts, not to have to spend tons of energy in covering up who they are, not to have it a big traumatic event to come out, but a celebration uh, within a context that, that's there for them.